Welcome everyone. Thanks for making time to join us this afternoon or morning or night, well, it depends on where you're from. Um, we'll be starting shortly. And just before we do, I'd like to go over some, uh, some notes. So we will be recording the session and since you've registered and attended, you will get a copy of the video uh, recording by email tomorrow. And uh, if you've missed that, then you can always check our help center, support.simapro.com in a few days. The recording will be up there as well. Um, and throughout the session, just feel free to keep the questions coming. You can use the chat box uh, and we will try to address them immediately or at the end of the session. <clears throat> So thanks again for joining us. We have a great uh, host of speakers this afternoon. So um, Xavier will be joining us as well as Teresa from uh, Qantas and uh, the developers of the database. Um, Xavier is an environmental engineer by training and he has all over 10 years uh, experience in LCA and footprinting and consulting. And he's uh, been involved as a project leader or an expert for over 100 uh, LCA projects worldwide so um, for companies as well as uh, public organizations so that's quite some experience Xavier glad to have you on board my pleasure thanks Ruba and Teresa also has an extensive background in uh, environmental engineering and uh, not only that but she also has an MBA as well as almost 10 years uh, of experience working in sustainability metrics data and models again thanks uh, Teresa for joining us Hello, everyone. So from our side, from the trade side, we have Michiel Ula uh, joining us, who's the CIMA Pro product specialist. Hi, Michiel. Hi, everybody. Hi, Should we mention how many years of experience you have? You don't want to know. 25 years uh, and a half. <laughs> 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 and uh, I'm, I'm, Ruben, I'm facilitating this session and uh, I've been with Prey for a little over eight years and I see that I can still make some, some um, spelling mistakes when it comes to sustainability. So sorry about that, uh, Xavier and Teresa, but uh, I'll move on before people notice that. <laughs> So what you can expect in the next hour, um, yeah, we'll start with some introductions and then Michiel uh, will show everybody how you can actually access the World Food Database where you can find on the website and what you need to do as a user. And then we'll move on to, uh, uh, to the Qantas uh, part. So they will give uh, some information about the, the background, how the initiative came together and who has been involved. They will also give an overview of the contents of the database and uh, finish up with a, a little tour in CIMA Pro so you can actually see it. Uh, so before we get into that, uh, just a little bit about uh, Prey. So we have uh, our core values are uh, innovation, transparency and collaboration, as you can see, before, for example, now uh in, in with regards to data and offering data from uh, various uh developers worldwide uh but our main mission is really providing the facts to drive positive positive change and by facts also um, metrics <clears throat> and we've been involved in a multitude of uh of projects and developments related to sustainability around the world so we're not only the developers of CIMA Pro but we're also involved with the UN Life Cycle Initiative. Um, uh, and we've been involved in the PEF and various other initiatives in regards to methodology and data. So uh, yeah, we're very proud of that. And some of the stats we're proud of is, of course, we have a global partner network representing uh, the CIMA Pro uh, reseller network around the world uh, with north of 10,000 users in 80 countries and 30 years of experience. Actually, I believe next week marks the 30th anniversary of Prey. Um, so hope to, uh, to continue on this path. <laughs> and just out of curiosity, I was wondering if uh, the audience, if you've already um, downloaded the database. So I would love to launch a little poll and give you a few seconds to see, okay, who has already downloaded and who's not. Okay. 
so far it's around 75% who have not downloaded. Okay, so yeah, so uh, it's around 75%. So that's a great, uh, great opportunity for you to hopefully um, uh, um, download the database after this uh, webinar, and Michiel will tell you all about it. One sec. So I'll hand over to you, Michiel. Yes. Um, yeah. Just... The, 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 the challenge to explain to you how to do download uh, the World Food Library database or LCA database. Um, it's really not that difficult. Um, you go to our website, and many of you will have received uh, an email with the link. Um, on that website, you can scroll down to fill in a form so that we know that you have downloaded it. Once you have filled in that form, you go to uh, yeah, a special site where you can download the installer actually as a zip file. Um, from that zip file, you can extract the installer um it's called setup wf ldb 3.5 xe it's a little bit technical um but if you double click it you will install uh, this database in your default database superpro database folder um installing the database does not mean that you can actually work with it because it's a standalone database it does not have any methods it does not connect to your projects and to do so, you need to import this database into your own working database. And that's typically what we call a professional database, but perhaps you renamed it uh, yeah, to your, well, whatever you, <laughs> you liked. Um, so it's really important that you uh, yeah, first install and then import this database. And actually in the zip file, you'll find instructions how to do this. Um, when this import is done, um it's not like equivalent because it's uh, it's not that big but um so it, it will not take hours but um afterwards you will see the uh, world food library uh, world food lca database in your library overview um so you can select it to use it in your projects and um yeah, that's it. And then you can can use it um, or not use it. Uh, you can compare it with um, with data from uh, EcoEvent or Archive Footprint or whatever. Um, yeah, that's up to you what what you want to do with it. Um, so it's not uh, that difficult. Um, if you have a multi-user version, it's uh, yeah, it's slightly different. Um, but that's explained in the uh, user instructions. It's nothing to worry about, but just read the instructions carefully and uh, you'll be okay. Um, yeah, okay. that's it from my side. Very short, but um, yeah, last thing, if you have any questions about importing and or find any issues, you can always contact support through our website or through the contacts the SIMA for help desk button or option under SIMA for help, the software. Okay, thank you. So I'll make uh, Xavier presenter so you can show your slides. There we are. Thank you, Ruga. Thank you, Michel. And uh, thank you all of you for uh, joining us today uh, for this introduction of the World Food LCA database. Um, so I'm Xavier, I'm a senior consultant at Qantas. Uh, I was the former project leader of the World Food Database for, um, for the past eight years. And since uh, the spring, uh, Teresa Levova um, has taken over that, uh, that role. And we're really happy to be there and share with you what we have uh, achieved in the past and, and what you will be able to uh, discover within CIMA Pro uh, with that uh, brand new release. So uh, without further ado, I'll uh, leave the floor to Teresa to give you some background about uh, where we come from. Yes, thank you, Xavier, and thank you for the introduction. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, we can make it work. So yes, before Xavier will dive into uh, what is actually, what kind of data and data sets you can find right now uh, in CIMA Pro, 
Um, we thought to give you a, a little bit of an introduction on where does the data come from, uh, um, what is the, the whole project about. And basically, the World Food LCA database is a product which is uh, a result of a global initiative which uh, Quantis initiated already uh, several years ago, together with some of our clients, some of our partners, which are, as you can see here in the logos, they are um, some of the big companies in the, the food industry. And the aim of the of the whole project of the initiative is rather straightforward. Uh, the main aim was to develop to generate emission factors for various uh, food products uh, when it comes to the products, you know, field production, so different kinds of crops, um, all the way to some processed food and so on. Um, it was not just to generate the emission factors themselves. We wanted to make sure that we also have the gate-to-gate -gate data. We, we are following a certain core principles in the database to ensure transparency, to make sure that people using this data can, can actually trust uh, the data being generated. And as you can see here on the right hand side, um, we the, the, the project itself, the initiative had several phases. The first one already uh, started in the 2012 to 2016. So you can see the project is very well established. Uh, it has uh, been running for several years now. Uh, the phase two was 2017-2019 and right now we are just about to start working on phase three. So you can see 2020-2022. Um, so the project is ongoing, it's not yet finished, uh, there is a plenty of work which still needs to be done uh, and what you see right now in uh, CIMA Pro is basically the outcome of the phase two but um, of course as I said we are keep working on the on the project so there will be uh, more data to come. The next slide please. Uh, what's different about phase three is that um, we have a new partner uh, we are working with, it's Peterson Control Union. And they, on this slide, you can see uh, basically a reason why uh, Quantis, we are experts on LCA and modeling and data. Uh, we are also very good at corporate climate footprinting. Uh, we know very well of how to model supply chains, but you know we are not all uh, we are not all knowing, and we realized that it would be good to partner with organization uh, which has um, as it's a, a, a huge expertise on agronomies and they have a lot of experience from the field directly. And this is exactly Petersel Control Union. It's an organization which is basically uh, providing audits. So they, they go directly to the field, they, um, they monitor what are the, the practices there, they, they work with basically the same partners we are working with, but making sure that uh, really the data they are collecting on the farm um, are uh, correct um, and really fitting the reality. Uh, so through this uh, partnership, we have now access to a lot of agricultural experts, um, their expertise. We have access to a lot of data. Uh, therefore, I mean, we expect that uh, phase three will be much richer than phase one and two, thanks to this collaboration. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Um, on this slide, you can see the partners we have in phase three. Uh, most of them were present already in phase two, which I think demonstrates that uh, they, they trust the work we do. Uh, when they keep going and keep working with us. So yeah, you see it's all, all the big guys. It's Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Unilever, Mars, Nestle, Sorimartek, General Mills. And we have a, one new partner, which is a coffee company, which we cannot yet publish the logo, but uh, I can assure you, you most probably had coffee from them at one point or another. <laughs> okay, next slide. So what are the core principles which are driving this initiative? Uh, basically, this initiative is what we call the pre-competitive project. So these partners which are present in the initiative, they can share this data together and they can work together um, only if they, they develop, uh, we are not working with data which are specific to, uh, to some of them. We are working with generic data which are uh, product, uh, country product averages, uh, which are basically uh, not specified to these partners, but are, are you know, general averages. So that's, that allows us to collect the data and publish them. Um, you can see here an overview of how it was in phase one, two, and three. So more or less eight, nine partners. This is how it always has been. And we were partnering with different, uh, you know, public agencies and scientific advisors to always have a um, little bit um, of a partner uh, to, to work with us uh, to develop the data sets. Um, when it comes to scope for the phase three, so what we are going to be working on following three years, this is always what the partners have to agree on. So we collect the wishes from the partners. Uh, you can imagine when we have a, uh, an espresso, they want to have a higher granularity on coffee. Uh, then we evaluate what all the other partners want and together with them, we define what kind of data will be collected in the future. Uh, yes, next slide, please. 
So the other core principle is transparency, which I touched upon already at the beginning. Uh, basically, there is a lot of documents which are publicly available. You see, we have these methodological guidelines uh, which are published. We have also additional document on the documentation of the database itself. Uh, you can, you can. Uh, uh, I think, Xavier, is it interactive? Can they find the links there on the slides or? The the link is at the top of the slide and uh, one of the okay no, we, we we it's not interactive there's the the URL is at the top and from there you can download the package. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. So you see the, the the link on the top. Um, another thing is that we are publishing unit processes. So when you have access to the database through Simapro, you can see the gate to gate data. So it's it's we we do not publish only cumulative LCI data. Uh, then another step we did when it comes to transparency is that already in the past, in 2016 and 2020, some of the data sets collected uh, during the World Food Database project have been published through EcoInvent as well. So you can you can find them now uh, in EcoInvent. Uh, now we decided to basically do what, what we are talking about uh, today, so to publish the whole database through Simapro directly. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Another core principle is consistency. So as you can imagine, thanks to the fact that we are working with all these partners together and we are having all these data sets under one umbrella, uh, we have one uh, guidelines, technical guidelines, we have one set of rules to ensure the quality of the data sets. Uh, this allows us that all the data sets are really um, consistent, the methodology behind them and the, the data collection system is consistent. So you can compare pears and apples and the difference in the results will be due to the really differences in environmental impacts and not because you are using different background data or making different modeling choices. Uh, we also aligned largely with uh, the rules of EcoInvent. So it is uh, it is yeah very much aligned with what EcoInvent is doing. And of course, thanks to the fact that we are part of uh, also of the EU product, uh, PEF guidance and project, uh, we are very much aware of all the individual documents in the different uh, projects, so we, we try to align to these rules as well. Also, the LEAP guide, uh, guidelines and the, the IDF guidelines as well. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Um, and the last slide on the general introduction, uh, most of the data behind these data sets are still from publicly available data, databases and scientific literature. So you can see Faustat here, Leap, most of the data you can you can trace backwards and you can find the original source of the information. We do have some primary data uh, there. We do have um, mainly what I would call also expert judgment. So whatever uh, whatever publicly available data we are using when we generate the data sets, then we have the, the, the experts from the partners who are looking at the data, reviewing, trying to help us to judge the quality of the data and whether they make sense. Um, primary data that, for example, we have for cocoa beans and production of insects, so some of the new technologies. Uh, yes, and all the data sources are reported, so you can find, Xavier will show you when he goes to Simapro, where you can find the documentation for all the individual data sets uh, in comments and how you can trace back where the data came from. Yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot, Teresa. I don't know if at this stage there's any question. Uh, Michelle Ruba, are you capturing anything so far? Not yet, to be fair, but um, I think it was clear. Okay, then... Uh, Wait, well, we'll... <laughs> there is one question. Is, uh, oh, sorry. So some... <laughs> oh, so some... sorry. Yeah, some of the background data is based on e-convent, so what do you... maybe it's a bit premature, but like, what are you planning to do in the future when, for example, equipment is updated? Can users expect an update as well of the World Food uh, Database? Yeah. So, uh, so in the in the it's a good question. In the version that you can directly install in Simapro, uh, the foreground World Food Database datasets are linked to a static copy of EcoInvent system processes. Uh, this is an agreement that we have with EcoInvent. And it's uh, very much the same as what you would find for uh, the Agribalis database, for instance, in, in CIMAPRO. Um, then we also have um, an agreement with, uh, with PRE that if uh, there is a lot of demand for uh, the World Food database, then we will consider updating the background uh, EcoInvent uh, database on a yearly basis. Okay, I think that answers the question. Thank you, Sophie. 
And before we move on to section two, we are also just curious about the audience and uh, where are they uh, attending from? So it would be great if you give us a hint, everybody, if you can fill in uh, which area in the world. Uh, I'm afraid go to only has five options for answers. So I kind of had to group the Americas. <laughs> Um, but still, that should just give us an idea. Okay, I think it's mostly Europe for now. I'm giving them a few seconds to fill things in. Okay. More than 80% who voted, so I'll close it for now <clears throat> and share the results. Yeah, so you see that uh, the audience is mostly from Europe at the time, at this time, but we also have representatives from uh, North and South America, Australia and Asia. Uh, so that's good to know. And um, I think Xavier will also brush upon the geographical coverage of uh, the data in his section. Yes, absolutely. So I think you're, you're probably all burning to learn about what is inside the database. And um, as its name um, uh, kind of uh, uh, expresses, uh, we call it the World Food LCA database because our, our scope is really about delivering information for uh, food production worldwide. And we have this approach when uh, uh, one of the partner, well, the partners are asking for a specific proc or crop or specific product. We look at which countries are exporting uh, the largest volumes of that product and we look for data whenever available we look for data for all of the countries that together uh, account for over 50 percent of global exports uh, hence the name world food lca database so what will you find now in cima pro it's it's a bit over 2000 and uh, 2300 data sets covering 120 products in 56 countries uh, over a pretty large uh, array of uh, product categories. Just to, to name some of them, it all starts with upstream uh, data sets. There's uh, a brand new uh, data for fertilizer production that were uh, developed in partnership with uh, Fertilizers Europe and Yara, a fertilizer company. Uh, by the way, these data sets you also find in EcoInvent by now, EcoInvent version 3.7. Um, there's uh, also data sets for uh, crops like cereals, uh, fruits, vegetables, herbs and spices, uh, and um, uh, specialty crops like cocoa, coffee with different production systems, nuts. Uh, and then uh, we, we move on to a series of, um, of data sets that represent food processing, including uh, things like uh, honey, tea manufacturing, coffee manufacturing, oils and fats, uh, finished uh, food products like margarine, pasta, bread, um, uh, packed water, and so forth, with and specific processes for food processing like dehydration, concentration, beverage production. Um, you'll also find a whole series of sweeteners, uh, both natural and artificial sweeteners, uh, and, uh, and uh, funky stuff like insects and, um, and, and so on. Uh, of course, there's a whole package also that you will find about animal production for uh, beef, poultry, uh, lamb, and pork, and uh, of course the different co-products, uh, including dairy, uh, eggs, and uh, and of course meat and co-products from slaughtering. So now let's give some examples of what you will find. Uh, first example here is about coffee. Uh, coffee is something that Ponis has been working on for many years now through our, our um, uh, corporate partnerships. What you will find in Wolfu database are data sets for uh, green coffee beans, uh, both Arabica and Robusta for, uh, let me count, I think it's 11 or 12 different uh, uh, regions. And, um, and with these data sets, we built a global average based on uh, market uh, market shares, so export shares uh, of, of green coffee beans. And then there are further processing steps into um, uh, roast and ground coffee, uh, decaf coffee, and freeze-dried and spray-dried coffee. And this is just to illustrate. And uh, of course, it's a lifecycle inventory database. It's cradle to gate or gate to gate, depending on the on the process. 
So uh, in the coffee data sets, you will find everything that relates to pesticides production, fertilizer production, and the machinery, and also uh, farm level processing, such as uh, coffee beans uh, depulping. Then, of course, um, the whole purpose of, of these data sets are, are to be used for LCA. So when you use an impact assessment method, method the, the one of your choice, you will be able uh, to disaggregate the information into different, uh, into a rather detailed contribution analysis. This, this slide is just to illustrate the type of information you might find and the, var the, the variability of the uh, carbon footprint in that case for green coffee beans, depending on location and variety of coffee. And, um, and you can see here uh, what are what could be different drivers like field emissions, or if you look at the purple bar, land use and land use change, which can be a very important uh, contributor to many uh, tropical crops in the database, such as coffee, cocoa, uh, uh, old palm, soy, or others. Another example, which I think is quite unique to World Food Database, is a, a pretty broad variety of nuts. Uh, you will find in Wolf Food Database cashew, hazelnut, peanuts, pistachios, and walnuts for multiple countries. Um, this is just to illustrate that, of course, depending on the production system and the country, there's a variety of yields, fertilizer input rates. Um, these values that you see here summarized in the table, you can all get directly from the Excel documentation that you can download. So when it comes to the documentation of Wolf Food Database, there's one PDF report that describes for each product category, the data sources and the modeling principles. And there is an Excel-based documentation with the data quality uh, ratings for each data set with all the data sources and all of the key input parameters, um, which uh, you have all at hand without the need to extract them manually from Semaphore. Again, some example with nuts, which in that case highlights Another area where we've been working uh, over uh, World Food Database Phase 2, which is crop residues management, which, uh, as you can see here in the case of cashew, is something that's extremely relevant when it comes to calculating the carbon footprint and the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, something that for long was not necessarily accounted for in LCA and now is, is becoming more and more standardized. And these are the, the types of things that we have integrated over the the last years, which were typically not available in, in the very first version of the World Food Database uh, when we didn't have access to uh, reasonable modules for crop residues. Um, some things that are um, more exotic or, or, um, or unique uh, as well is the example of quinoa, where um, we identified in the, in the data development process that there were basically two very distinct type of typologies of farming practices for quinoa, and both end up on the international, international markets. There's what we call traditional cultivation of quinoa in Peru and the intensive production, and it's two totally different ways of cultivating that plant. And, uh, and, and this is the types of distinctions that you can uh, visualize and understand using World Food Database. Um, of course, it was also highlighted earlier, we've been working with an insect uh, producing uh, company and you'll find data for crickets, but also for mealworm, uh, including the, the feed production and the whole, uh, all the processing steps up to the, the, the product that can be used for uh, animal feed, for instance, or, uh, or uh, an alternative source of protein. And uh, finally, another example I wanted to share with you relates to tea in that case. Um, so uh, upstream, we've been working on uh, creating LCI data sets, modeling LCI data sets for tea leaves in, uh, in uh, Sri Lanka and in Kenya and in China. And, um, and as a second step, we worked on the processing steps that uh, are uh, transforming the, the fresh tea leaves into black or green tea. And this is typically what you will find in the database. So you will find in the database both the fresh tea leaves and the processing steps and the final black tea and green tea products for different countries. So that was a short tour of some examples of things that you will find. Now I intend to show you how it looks like in CMAPO. Um, Would you mind if we take a few questions uh, before yeah, that, Xavier? 
yes <laughs> okay so there were a number of questions about pesticides is it uh, included and if it i know you brushed upon that in terms of uh of the coffee uh, but for example do you have pesticide inventories with active ingredients or just categories like pesticide herbicide fungicide so um it depends so when it comes to pesticide production we do not we did not model any new data set for pesticides production we are relying on the data sets from ecoinvent however we we, we have clustered um we have created kind of clusters of um uh, of, of typical pesticide mixes for categories of crops um based on data provided by the european commission and and this allows us to model pesticide inputs and of course uh, emissions to the environment uh, at different levels of granularity depending on the on the on the information that we could get from the literature so when we do did have access to specific active ingredients it's modeled at that level of course mm -hmm. uh, when we did not and we only could access information like a certain amount of herbicide a certain amount of fungicide then we use these uh, typical mixes okay. that we use all right and uh, are food colorants included as well food sorry food colorants colorants no we don't have any no not yet we have sweeteners and uh, and a few other additives but not um uh, not colorants okay and regarding what you mentioned about the the use of uh, some background ecovent data uh, some uh, of the attendees are wondering uh, which system allocation was used Yes, we're using the cutoff allocation system. Okay. Great. Or recycled content, as it's called now. Okay. Maybe just one more for now. Um, and do you, do you have a complete database for the insects per type of feed? I'm not sure if the question is clear. Um, so we have, as I said, we have data for uh, crickets and for mealworm uh maybe a third one but i'm not sure i think that's that's all and that includes specific uh feed mixes that are used to feed the insects um but uh, i'm not sure that's exactly the question then insects insects flowers themselves can be used to feed uh livestock for instance but that's another story okay well we have a bunch of questions still but maybe uh, we can take uh we can address them after uh you've given the tour sure so let me Swap to CIMAPRO. Can you just confirm you can still see the screen? Yeah, that seems good. Okay, so in CIMAPRO, the way it will look like, here I, I opened the library itself, but you will, we're in the, in the, in the process tree in CIMAPRO, uh, you will quickly find your way around um, the different, uh, different processes uh, within uh, material. Basically, everything is in there. Within material, you will find under the agricultural, label uh, a whole set of things that relate to animal feed so feed ingredients here uh, and specific what we call feed baskets which are typical feed mixes for different production systems of, um, of uh, livestock or or uh, or poultry or uh, or swine um, so these are, are for feed and then you will find everything that relates to animal productions or avian bovine dairy insects and so forth and each of them, uh, you will find uh, an average per country, and you will find different um, uh, different production. Uh, where is it here? Different production systems. If you look at swine, we have three types of production system for swine: so backyard system, industrial system, and intermediate system. All of these are described in the uh, in the in the, the documentation. So you, it's that structure that you will find for all animal products. Uh, plant oils, this uh, you're probably familiar with it. Uh, plant production are organized first by cereals and fruits, uh, where you will find plenty of berries, for instance, like blackberry, cherry, uh, raspberry, uh, what else? Elderberry, cranberry, uh, for a number of things, as well as citrus and mango and pineapple. Um, herbs and spices with uh, uh, things like uh, mint and parsley, stevia. Uh, you will find two types of mushrooms, so shiitake and uh, and what we call uh, uh, 
champignons de Paris in French, or champignons in English, mushroom. Plenty of nuts, as I, just, as I explained earlier, and so forth. So you can navigate through plant production here, a number of things. And then you will have below another category that's called beverages, where you will find the processed coffee data sets, uh, juices uh, for uh, apple, grape, lemon, and orange, mineral water with different packaging materials, non-dairy drinks for oat and almond drink, as well as tea, which I highlighted earlier. And finally, well, so finally in the chemical section, you will find our uh, fertilizer data sets as well as our pesticide uh, mixes. So you can see here, for example, fungicide unspecified mix for cereal crops, and then there's a different mix for citrus and different mix for fruit trees. So these are things that you can use in case you don't have information about specific active ingredients in your production system. And then under the label food, you will find um, transformation of animal products, such as uh, beef, uh, lamb, pork, poultry, all these are co-products from slaughtering. You will find a series of dairy products uh, with different transformation steps, and you will find some cereal products and flowers and so forth. Xavier, I don't see any fish, uh, so I believe it's not included, but are you planning to include it anytime in the future? So as of today, we don't have any fish. This is absolutely true. Um, this is part of the discussions we are currently having with the partners of phase three. Some of them are looking for data for fish and, and seafood. However, we also know that there's been quite some initiatives around seafood, especially in France. So we, we, are, we first want to check if what our partners are looking for is not already being developed by other data providers. Yeah, I understand. And another interesting question, if there's any work on wine. Um, so not specifically, we have data for grapes, but we do not have, we haven't modeled uh, wine production uh, or beer for that sake, uh, not, uh, not yet, but part of the scope. Yeah. Uh, one question from my side, um, is there any plan to, yeah, elaborate on, on our organic versus non-organic production? whether it's uh, plants or, or meat or whatever? Um, so this is, Mary, maybe Teresa, you want to answer that one? Yes, yes, I can step in. So, um, I mean, you probably know that this is quite a challenging topic. So we've oh, been yeah. doing some work, uh, work around it. Um, we did some exercises to try to do it for some crops and the outcome was rather um, unsatisfactory. So. Uh, it's something which, of course, um, everybody is asking for, uh, but because there is not even a clear definition what what organic means, I mean, there are different definitions and different organizations having different interpretations, it, it's very hard to, to develop data set which calls organic because there is a set of choices you have to make in the background. So, yeah. no, we didn't develop. We might work on it more in phase three, but yet again, it's a, it's a very complex topic, so we cannot promise anything. Thank you. Clear. So yeah. something I wanted to illustrate still uh, before we take more questions is uh, how the data sets are structured in CIMAPO and, and again transparency is really important to us. Um, often in LCI database you will find data sets that are um, scaled to one kilogram of product and um, uh, from our experience it was uh, easier to understand and to assess and also to, to, to adapt, if you want to adapt the input data, because as you know, in Simapo, you can copy a data set from a library and you can change the input data and the activity data uh, in, the, in, the, in the foreground system. So all our um, data sets, uh, crop production data sets, uh, have a reference flow of one hectare, which is actually labeled in the, in the yield, so the, the amount of kilograms that is produced per hectare and year, and uh, so if you take blueberry in the US, you will find a reference flow of 7,202 kilograms and all of the input um, uh, data, input and output and emissions and so forth are uh, scaled to that annual uh, yield. And, and this is really important for you to know. Of course, when you use uh, uh, blueberry uh, in one of your uh, foreground models in one of your LCAs, 
then uh, you can pick as many kilograms of blueberries as you want, or if you just an analyze blueberry at farm, what CMAPO will display is not the impact for 7,202 kilograms, will be the impact for one kilogram. And so we are using this nice functionality from CMAPO uh, to display something that we think is much more understandable than having life cycle inventories for one kilogram of crop. Yeah. So this is an important aspect I want to share. And what another thing is in the comment field here on the right, we have documented for most of the flows, the data source, the assumptions, uh, or the approximations when we had to make some. Sometimes we have to use we have to use proxy for the inventory to be comprehensive. So all this is documented here. And in the documentation tab in the general comment field, you will find a general description of what is the crop, what is included or excluded in the data set, what is the yield, whether it's irrigated or not, and what type of production system it is. And, and so forth. So um, this is the, the documentation you will find. And yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we can take some more questions. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, Xavier, I have one question. I always wondered, I mean, because, um, um, yeah, the, the production of crops in, in real, yeah, in per year varies a lot, depending on the weather and, and all that sort of things. Uh, how do you account for this? I mean, the 7,202 kilograms for blueberry, is it uh, for one year or is it an average over 10 years or 20 years, whatever? So typically what we do is whenever possible, we look for data that is average over several years. So for example, when we will look for yields that are derived from FAO stat, we'll take a four years average. And when we look for literature data, we will uh, if possible, look for literature data that is also based on multi-annual averages, specifically for, for that reason. Uh, okay. If it's not the case, it's specified in the documentation. No. And apart from the yields, I assume the, all the inputs and, and pesticide use and all that sort of things is, is similarly calculated. Yes, and, and th this, is the, this is the core principle. Then, of course, we're, we're constrained by data availability, so sometimes you just find one or two data sources that tell you about fertilizer use for blueberries. I don't know if that's the case here. Uh, and, uh, and, and without further information, this is what we will use, of course, then. Part of the uh, internal quality control and review process, so although the database was reviewed by a third party, by Acoscope, uh, the Swiss um, Agronomic Institute. And yeah. uh, so this is also part of the process to check the validity of the input data on the agro uh, agronomic side. Okay, thank you. Another question just before you move away from the documentation is there was a question if you uh, where to find the PDF for each of the data sets? I think you mentioned it. Is it the links you showed or oh okay yeah great. It's yes exactly so maybe side. I can show, show yeah. it right away. So the link mm -hmm. I shared is it's quantis-intl.com slash WFLDB uh, which links to that same web page. It's the web page of the World Food Database on our Qantas website. And if you scroll down to the very bottom, maybe we'll try to make it more visual. Sorry for that. You have here uh, a download now button. And if you click there, what you will see is a zip file in which, uh, in which you will find everything that you need, the methodological guidelines, the review report from Agroscope, the list of data sets, and the PDF and Excel documentation. It's all in that zip file that you can download in a single click. Yeah. Great, thanks. And there were a few questions uh, about the data again. Um, so the, 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 one of the users noticed the others category and I was just curious, so what falls under others? Uh, what falls under others? So I don't remember. <laughs> Let's check together. <laughs> uh, what falls under others? So under others here, actually, it, 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 this is where you find the copies from EcoInvent, the system okay. process copies of EcoInvent. I think we, we have managed to avoid any other category within the World Food Database. Maybe we did not, but I hope we did. Okay. And we have an, another question that there um, they notes a number of, of options under beef. If you could maybe just show that again and explain briefly what the different options are. Yes, yeah, so within food and beef, this is 
processed beef or so slaughtered beef. So here you will find the different co-products from beef slaughtering. So uh, cat, so I'll just open one. It's, it's going to be more visual here for Brazil. Uh, so you see here a multi-output data set with different co-products and different amounts and the allocation key. Um, so it's not pre-allocated. The data sets are, are, are provided uh, with all the co-products being visible. And, uh, and here you find the fresh meat, uh, the offal, the bones, the fats, the category three byproducts used for pet food, for instance, the hides and skins, and the slaughtering process. So this is typically outputs from slaughtering. Uh, but if we look at animal production and go to bovine here, uh, so here on the transformation, you will find the country averages for uh, cattle, beef cattle. So for example, and, 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 and here for Australia, we, we have defined that the average beef cattle in Australia is uh, different percentages of different production systems. So what we call mixed systems, what we call feedlot or intensive system, what we call grassland system. And if you go to one of them, like the grassland system, so all these are called what we call our Woku database archetypes that are still under bovine. Then you can see the detail of the inventory of the beef cattle grassland system, for instance. Okay, thank you. And just a few more questions about what is in the database. Um, two things, oils and honey. So honey and? Oils. Oils, yes, okay. So let's have a look. Uh, oils and honey. So honey should be uh, under sweeteners. Where is it? Uh, up, up. I'm trying to find the sweetener. Okay, we'll do like that. Honey. Okay, honey, we have two types of honeys. Uh, depending on the type of production, we have what we call uh, large scale production and small scale production. Uh, different data sources, one for the US, one for Switzerland. And we have raw honey and then processed honey. Uh, that's all based on literature data and it's all documented. So you can find this. And the other one was oils, you said, so oil. Uh, so let's do like that, up. Uh, uh, it won't be so easy like that. So let's go to the food, uh, plant oils. Okay, so here you will find oils from a variety of oil crops, such as linseeds, maize, olive, Palm, rapeseed, soy, coconut, sunflower, and and that's, that's it. That's quite a list. Yeah. Great. Sophia, I have an, uh, another question uh, out of curiosity. I mean, you, you're now focused in this database mostly on the production of foodstuff. Um, in the past, in, in Singapore, we had a Danish LCA food database, which also contained data on, on the next part of the supply chain, you know, going to the supermarket and, and uh, the baking and cooking processes at the consumers' homes. Is that something you want to incorporate in the future, or is it something that is... Uh, again, what we incorporate is based on the priorities set by our uh, partners. Yep. So, and so far, so far, focus has been on expanding the database to more crops and more production systems, rather yep. than uh, further emphasis on the transformation and uh, and whole value change up to the consumers. Okay. Uh, however, we do have some things here that you will find under processing, home cooking. Okay. Yeah. Here, you will find specific data sets for like baking, boiling, frying, microwaving, and so forth. So different things like that, and the process of dehydration, um, yeah. and a few other things here yeah. that I don't recall. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> now it's interesting because uh, I recently read an article about uh, food waste. I mean, it's not. I mean, we, we produce a lot of 
food waste, uh, well, from the supermarkets, but also from the consumers. So it's, it would be nice to see that in, uh, yeah, back in an LCA database. But, uh, that's something to be uh, followed up yeah. later. Yeah. I guess, I guess the, the, the challenge is to give a fair and, and generic representation of supply chains. Um, it's extremely difficult. If you take the example of cocoa, uh, we mm -hmm. did access data on um, on the cocoa value chain. So the, the cocoa beans, where they are transported to to be processed into uh, cocoa, cocoa products. Uh, and, but that's not information that's so easily accessible. We we could access that because of our partnership with a with a cocoa company or chocolate mm -hmm. company. Um, yeah. to do that for every single crop. I mean. It's probably doable, but it's it's not been at the core of our scope so far. Okay. No. Uh, Xavier, there is one question which uh, Ruba forwarded me, but I think you are better to answer. <laughs> How is the land use change model in the database? Yes. Okay. So the land use change model. I'm sure you've all heard about the the tool that was developed uh, years ago by Blanc Consultants called the Direct Land Use Change Assessment Tool. Um, so we, we started from there, from the first version of that tool, which was publicly available. Uh, and we have been, uh, we have been working on, um, on updating the background data uh, of, the, of that tool uh, and including some uh, additional uh, carbon stocks uh, that were not present in the initial version of that tool, which I think have been uh, introduced in the latest version that that Blanc Consultants uh, is also uh, making available, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, our our land use change is, is a statistical uh, direct land use change assessment at country level. Uh, so we look at how much land was converted from natural land to crop land in different countries. And we allocate this to different crops based on um, what we call the, the crop specific approach. So based on the, 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 the increase of uh, cultivated area over 20 years uh, for that crop in that country. So if you look at a crop which uh, harvested area has decreased over the last 20 years, you won't see any land use change. If you look at a crop which has increased in surface and that at the same time in that country uh, natural land such as primary or secondary forest was lost then uh, part of that uh, deforestation of land use change will be allocated to the specific crop and this is all explained in our in the uh, in the methodological guidelines that we publish together with Ecoscope. Okay, thank you. So I think we still have some time for a few more questions. Uh, one question was uh, for gate to gate, uh, for example, for cereals or flour, um, <clears throat> processed foods, uh, is packaging included? So it is generally not, but when it is, it's specified. So uh, there are some specific data sets for which packaging is included. For instance, I mean, on the on the cradle to gate data set for crops, we do include fertilizer and pesticide packaging, for instance. Uh, we do include the packaging for bottled water, uh, mm -hmm. but we do not include the packaging for dairy products, for instance. Okay, I think that's clear. So it's always good good, good to double check the, the documentation and the data set itself. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and another question about the, the data coverage specifically to China. Can you tell a little bit, from, or maybe from the top of your head, what do you have for China in the database? Um, from the top of my head, I couldn't tell, but we can check like that. So you will find, uh, well, yes, fertilizers specific to Chinese production, almonds, asparagus, apple, beef, what else do I see, tea, uh, eggs, uh, what else do I see? Carrot, maize, mandarin, a uh, series of things. So we need to look into the details. Peanuts, mushrooms, rice, potato. So quite some things from China. Yeah, quite a lot. Yeah. And another interesting question was if you would be open to including hydroponics. 
So we do have hydroponics, but, uh, but only for one data set. If I'm not mistaken, it's for tomato. Um, so let me check or yes, here you see it. So we have tomato fresh grade, uh, fr fresh grade from greenhouse and hydroponic uh, in the Netherlands and in Spain. So this is, uh, it's the only data set we have for hydroponic, yeah. to be honest. Okay, great. And um, I think an interesting question, maybe the final one, uh, because we could wrap up and there's a lot of questions and we'll be very happy to get back to these open questions via mail in the coming days. But maybe a nice question to end is if you are looking to include more partners or if some people would like to contribute data, how would they go about doing that? Okay, then Teresa, that one's for you. Yes, that's fine for me. <laughs> um, of course, uh, we are always looking for new partners to, to join the initiative you know, as an industrial partner, basically, so to be one of the one of the let's call it co-sponsors of the initiative. But of course, we are also looking for other partners which would be, for example, willing to share data with us. So I, I saw, you know, I think there is a lot of academics on the on the webinar which generate a lot of data systems. So it's end up in the literature, and then uh, sometimes we use it. But if we have direct contact with the with the people who are doing the research, that that would be absolutely amazing. So yes, this is one of the channels of how you can make your work to be used and to be spread around so feel free to contact me directly and, and we can have a chat of what we can do together great thank you so much Teresa um Michiel did you have any closing remarks or any questions you still want to um, well perhaps a follow-up I mean um we slightly discussed about e uh, updating uh, the the background data of eco event but what is your own uh, plan to update this uh, World Food Database? Can we expect yes. an update uh, every two years, or what is your plan? So, so we the the the, the World Food uh, si World Food Database cycles are are three year cycles, uh, so these phases. Um, so now that we are publishing the output of phases one and two, we will wait until we have we are done with phase three because it's an iterative process over three years with continuous improvements. Um, so the, the brand new uh, version of World Food Database, uh, we will all have to wait until, um, until what, in three years from now? Um, yeah. to, more or less. Yeah. 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 And that will, that will mean an update of all the current data plus additional data, I assume? I hope. Exactly. Exactly. You know, what I always say is a database is a, is a living animal and if you don't take care of it, it's going to die out. So, <laughs> of course, uh, I mean, part of the project is to make sure that the current database is kept up to date. So it will be updated, it will be expansion, new crops, new geographies, but uh, of course, new, new methodology. Um, but of course, uh, also update the existing things. Okay. Clear for me. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I think we can um, yeah, sort of close this session. Uh, I found it really interesting. I mean, I work with the database, but it's good to hear you explaining uh, the World Food Database yourself. Uh, and I really appreciate your, uh, yeah, your effort. I, I'm really impressed with your work, to be honest. Um, so I hope, yeah, I really look forward to, to the next update in, in three years time. And I hope we can perhaps uh, continue with working with you with other updates. Um, yeah, Ruba, perhaps you have something to add or yes, add? I hope. Yeah, I, uh, so I hope the 75% of the audience who had not downloaded yet would be now uh, triggered to go and check out the data. Um, so, uh, and again, if you have any. Okay, there are a bunch of open questions that we will address by email and we will send them to the entire audience so you have an idea of what was asked um, and you will get a copy of the recording and uh, some of you asked for the slides as well so we are happy to include that as well um, yeah and thanks again for for participating um, and uh, thanks again for the speakers I think it was a great session and we will be in touch and hope to see you virtually soon in the future Thank you all and thank you the pre-team for this partnership and for setting that up. Much appreciated.
Okay, thank you guys. Have a nice day. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Goodbye, everybody.